Um, thank you so much for um, coming to this webinar on Friday afternoon. Um, and I want to say first off how much I appreciate your efforts um, to assist youth in the Tampa Bay area. And I also want to say thank you to the Crisis Center um, of Tampa Bay for providing the um, technology support for this um, for this webinar. And I also want to say thank you to the Tampa Bay Rescue and Restore Coalition for providing um, this opportunity for me to pre present my research on sex trafficking or commercial sexual exploitation of girls in Florida. And I'll say a little bit about myself. My, my name is Joan Reed, and I'm a professor at the University of South Florida in St. Petersburg. And some of you actually may know me. I've been, I worked as a trauma therapist in the Tampa Bay area for about 10 years before I uh, began teaching at um, USF St. Pete. And I actually worked in Pinellas County and Hillsborough County, I was thinking about this today, and Pasco County. So I've probably run into to many of you um, in the past. And then um, the research that I want to talk to you today about was actually funded um, in 2012 by the American Psychological Association. And they funded my research in order to explore trauma bonding and trafficked youth. And the purpose of the research was to inform treatment practices and to address the long-term psychological consequences of exploitation and sex trafficking. And based on that study, I developed this webinar. And the webinar um, is designed to uh, discuss the links between schemes of sex traffickers and victim vulnerabilities. And when those two combine, they create heightened susceptibility to commercial sexual exploitation or sex trafficking, and I'll be using those terms pretty much interchangeably today. And so the, the information that I'll be talking about today is based on my review of 93 cases of CSEC or sex trafficking of girls um, in Florida. So this is what I'll be kind of going through today just to give you a heads up and, and some information about where we're headed. So first I want to look at strategies or you could call it the MO of child sex traffickers that are involved in the Florida cases. And we'll look at first at the recruitment or entrapment strategies. You could call them either, either one of those. How do they recruit girls or entrap them? And then how do, how do they keep them um, under their control or, or what I called enmeshment strategies. And so how do they keep them under their control once they've recruited a youth? And then we'll look at victim vulnerabilities or what makes a girl most susceptible to these strategies of sex traffickers. There are general vulnerabilities and then more specific vulnerabilities that apply to girls with intellectual disabilities or girls who were trafficked by family members. And the last thing that we'll do today is to discuss what the implications of these of this um, information is and how we can apply it. So you may be you know, asking yourself, why are we going to look at offenders? Why should you study offenders? And the reason is that by understanding what the strategies of offenders, we can be better prepared to assist in protecting vulnerable individuals, adults or, or youth. And um, in considering adolescent girls, if you just think about that population, you realize that just by um, their youth, their age, their lack of psych psychosocial maturity, it casts doubt on their ability to detect exploitive motives or withstand manip manipulation of sex traffickers or recruiters. Therefore, um, it becomes par of paramount importance for us as caregivers or service providers to understand offender strategies so that we can build, quote, a better fence around these girls or a better barrier um, when, we're trying, when we're talking about prevention of sex trafficking. And it's interesting, one of uh, the researchers that I um, have read a lot of his research, he's probably a, the leading expert or one leading expert on child maltreatment in the United States, he recently noted that Sexual abuse is a highly motivated activity um, that's conducted by devious and powerful adults, and it cannot be prevented or deterred by the actions of children. 
All right, so we can't expect these these girls who are at risk to be able to prevent it from happening to them. Therefore, it's critical for professionals and caregivers who are responsible for these at-risk youth to be aware of offender strategies and provide enhanced and effective uh, barriers or protection. So um, the next thing that I want to talk about is um, previous research. I just have one slide on this, I promise. But uh, so there's still questions, I'm sure, and um, kind of a debate about how big the problem is, what the size of the problem, how many girls are trafficked, right, in Florida or the United States. Um, but research is pretty um, is pretty solid and in that um, many studies have found that girls are entrapped in exploitation through romantic promises and manipulation of a trafficker or pimp who's posing as a boyfriend. And also, um, gang members have a, coined a term for this recruitment technique, calling it love bombing, and that, was, uh, that was, came out of research in Canada. And then some research um, recently was done where they're interviewing sex traffickers, and one was quoted, I think this is actually from a song, but he was quoted as saying, with young girls, you promise them heaven and they'll follow you to hell. So much of the research that we have on this, though, is built on samples of about 10 to 15 girls or anecdotal. So it's just case by case. So the purpose of my research was to gather a large amount of cases and see if I could see patterns that developed so that we could get a more complete and comprehensive picture of CSEC or sex trafficking that's occurring uh, with girls in Florida. And, and I will um, keep talking about girls, uh, not that boys aren't trafficked, but at this point we just don't have enough research on what's going on with girls. The case files that I had access to um, were uh, from girls. So the Florida study that I did, like I said, I um, reviewed 93 case files of traffic girls. They were all trafficked between 2008 and 2012. Um, and I also conducted, just to kind of validate what I was reading in, in the case files, I interviewed um, 10 caseworkers or counselors who work full time with girls who were, um, had been trafficked. And the Site locations where I got this information was Tampa and Miami. And just this is um, the frequency of use that I have listed here is, is for the next slides. So I have, I coded them um, if, if a certain tactic was reported uh, 10 or more times and in three or more interviews, I coded it as many. If it was in three to nine cases, and two interviews, then I coded it as some. And then if it was mentioned in one or two cases of one interview, I wanted to document that it was occurring, but I not noted it as few. So these are, um, that's kind of, when you look at the next slide, that's what those, um, those would mean, all right? The terms mean. All right, so you can see, um, this is the first two slides, the next, this slide and the next slide really cover what I discovered as the most common um, recruitment or entrapment scheme. So this is what um, the traffickers were using to entice or to entrap a girl in sex trafficking. And some of these won't be surprising to many of you because these are things that we've seen in other research or um, anecdotally in trainings, et cetera, that you've had. So um, the first uh, one that I have listed there is to flatter or romance the girls. So show a lot of love, sweet talk them, um, show off wealth. And so a lot of these girls haven't seen wealth before, and they've been um, they're from disadvantaged neighborhoods or families. So these these things are very effective and powerful. Um, also, they take them on dates, and the one the places that were most commonly mentioned were Red Lobster and Olive Garden. I have no idea why. Um, they also would take them to Disney um, Park or Bush Gardens. So the, the sum of it was that they gave them something they never had previously, and it had a very powerful effect. Um, the second type of um, strategy they used was to be become an ally or uh, to build trust. And so whatever, whoever, whoever the enemy or the problem was, 
they would um, bond with the girl as their ally. So if, it, if they needed help running away from a home or a group home, they would help them. If they needed to avoid the police or authorities, they would help them. If they needed a place to stay, they would provide it. Um, so that was kind of the next way that they um, would pull them into their, to their, into a relationship. Um, also, another um, recruitment strategy that was commonly noted was to normalize sex or selling sex. And this was done by um, joking around about sex, talking about sex, talking about prostitution, asking the girls about their sexual experiences, having um, sex with the girl and taking sexually explicit pictures of her, exposing them to pornography or prostitution in some way. And then probably the most effective way that they normalized this was they used girls to recruit girls. And so uh, if you know anything about teenagers, that is the, you know, they are more um, prone to follow their, their peers than they are to an, an, another adult or an authority figure. And so this was very effective if they saw that some girl that was their age who possibly was an acquaintance of theirs or a girlfriend who was already involved in this um, type of exploitation, it became, it seemed more normal. Um, they would also isolate them. They might not take their phone from them or um, not, or, you know, turn off their Facebook page or whatever they were using, but they would often get the password. And so they had control over who they could call or what they could post. Um, often they would um, take them to another city or out of state, which kind of disoriented the girls, and um, it was easier for them to fall under their control. So this is the um, second page of, um, just wanted to check that everyone can hear me while, before I keep going on. Um, so the, the next page is also more recruitment strategies, so sometimes um, not as often as the other types of strategies. <clears throat> but there were cases where the girls were abducted or drugged. So they were um, given drugs, kidnapped, held hostage, usually in a, in a drug house. And um, so this was, it did, did occur and it um, was very uh, traumatic. Also, they, I didn't really know what to call the next type of strategy. I called it a bait and switch. So basically, um, for example, the one I have, the next slide, the next section down is um, there was three girls that ran away together and someone approached them on the street and gave them $1,300, $1,400 and said, oh, I'm just trying to be nice. You look like you need some money. This will get you started. And then, um, so they spent the money, of course. They're 14-year-old girls. And then a few days later, this person returned and asked for repayment. And when they didn't have the money, he threatened to kill them or their families or unless they worked for him. Um, they might help them, um, help girls run away and um, travel with them. And then, I, I guess this was rather shocking to me, but they would withhold food. Um, so, um, you know, everyone else around them would be able to eat, but if they didn't earn money, um, they wouldn't be, everyone else would be eating at McDonald's or whatever, but until they earned some money, they uh, weren't given any food. They would withhold their cell phone, threaten them. Um, there were some uh, girls who were unaccompanied mi uh, minors whose parents had left them in the U.S. And, um, you know, they would also in the same way get, you know, be given shelter, but then um, after a short term, they would be told, you know, you have to prostitute in order to pay for what I've um, given you. There were cases of boyfriend, quote, and gang members, so boyfriends who are gang members who would um, persuade girls to prostitute. Um, and then the last two um, categories are uh, two that I'm going to cover kind of separately because they're really unique. Uh, one is that the sex traffickers, I was not really ne necessarily expecting to see this as much as I did but they preyed on disability, specifically those who were, had an intellectual disability. Um, so the youth were really unaware that they were being exploited and, and some were unable to even distinguish you know, the difference between a boyfriend and a John or a boyfriend and a trafficker. And then there was uh, another group that were trafficked by their family members. And we'll talk about those in more detail later.
All right, so once they're entrapped, what, what, how did they keep them? This is what I called enmeshment tactics. So um, what, you know, what, how did they keep them from leaving or, or going back home? And it's interesting, one of the first ways that was mentioned most commonly was to convince them that no one else would have them. So after all that sweet talk and gift giving in the beginning, uh, once the girl had actually um, become involved in sex trafficking, the, the message flipped and basically was like, you're no good anymore and what else can you do? There's nothing else that you can do. So basically, um, you know, convincing her that she has no other options. Um, they would also blackmail them or, and uh, so, you know, threaten to send photos uh, to their family. And then uh, they would also uh, instill in them a deep sense of obligation. So they would convince them that they, they had been rescued from worse, that, you know, I got you out of that awful place wherever they were living, and, you know, I did all this for you, and you owe me. Um, they wouldn't necessarily say you owe me, but that was the message. And loyalty became the utmost virtue. So the last thing that um, these girls wanted to do was to be a snitch and to turn on their on their trafficker. Um, so then the next um, enmeshment tactic that was very effective was to make them complicit in crime. So um, they would have them recruit their girlfriends. So then at that point, they really are uh, considered a sex trafficker. Um, they would have them assist with a business or other crimes such as shoplifting or um, some kind of, you know, fraud. And they would also force them to assist in controlling and abusing other girls. And so they became um, complicit in crime and they felt trapped like, uh, you know, they had no way out. About 30% of them became pregnant and had a child or have became pregnant, they didn't necessarily all have ch have, their, have the child, but that, that the child would be with a trafficker or an other, another uh, John. Um, they would also isolate them. They would take and carry their cell phone, change the number, um, keep their Facebook password. Um, also, they would hold them against their will. So it wasn't, it's really interesting. It's not, um, you know, technology is an amazing thing. And they didn't necessarily have to lock all the windows and doors. Um, nowadays, you can have all kind of security systems in your home. You know this from commercials, et cetera, with, um, that you can basically, if someone opens the door, you can be notified immediately on your cell phone. So they were using things like that in order to keep them, um, to hold them, against their, hold them against their will, make them feel like they couldn't leave. And also, they used financial control. So they would buy things for them, but they wouldn't necessarily let them have any, any money of their own. Um, okay, and so this, this is a huge uh, list of different ways that they would intimidate the girls in order to maintain control. So if, the, if there was a child, they would uh, threaten to take or harm the child, sell the baby, put, them up, put the baby up for adoption. Uh, force them to watch rape of other of other girls, or threaten to rape them, or rape them. Uh, show weapons, threaten at gunpoint, um, threaten with the potential of arrest to kick them out, to abandon them, to return them to foster care. Threaten to kill them or their family members. They were routinely beaten uh, and raped by the traffickers. Um, they there was a few cases where they they um, got pregnant and they were beaten and they they had a miscarriage. Um, there were few cases that they were threatened by the gang, and, and, and the one case that I was very um, that I remember very well was that there were a girl that was threatened, and her friend had been raped and killed by a gang uh, in the recent past. So she took the threat from the gang very seriously. Um, and then um, this last. Um, tactic that they used is probably the most insidious in that they would, at the same time as all this craziness was going on that I just read, they would provide hope and connection and some kind of false family. So they would promise them that they would be their best girl again, that, you know, we can get back to that happy place where we were earlier. They would convince them that they were, quote, the special ones. And so 
very, um, it, you know, I ask and ask and ask the case managers to try to explain this to me. And they would use different tactics to make them each girl feel like she was the special one. So even if a trafficker had, you know, numerous girls that he was exploiting, each one of them he could keep um, kind of deceived and, um, and, and feeling like they were the special one. They were getting better treatment than everyone else, and they were really, uh, you know, very important to him. And then this last one is that this idea that no one can understand you, me, or us and what we've been through. So this creates a barrier between the girl and everyone else. So no one else in the world can ever understand what you've been through. Even if I was the one causing the trauma, no one else will understand what you've been through. And um, so um, sometimes, uh, I just want to say one more thing about that. Sometimes um, when they, the girls would talk about um, the trafficker and other, other victims that would be uh, involved as kind of a team or a family, but others described it as competition and jealousy. So sometimes the trafficker set up a lot of competition and jealousy between the girls. And that uh, basically set him up as, and I'm using him, I'd say 75% uh, of the time the traffickers were male, um, set him up as kind of the only person that, that was safe or was trustworthy in the mind of that girl. All right, so after we've, now that we've looked at kind of um, the strategies of the offenders, and I want to check one more time that it was everyone here. Okay. Um, I want to talk about the types of vulnerability that the that these strategies work well with, or that um, kind of intensify the susceptibility of a girl to sex trafficking and to these strategies. And the first is really a general kind of general vulnerabilities that every uh, that were kind of present in, in many of the cases. And then there's some specific vulnerabilities of girls with intellectual disabilities. And there's also some specific circumstances that are present um, pretty com in, in cases where the girl is being trafficked by a family member. So um, the first thing I want to talk about is um, the age that, uh, the average age at initial exploitation and sex trafficking. And I have this chart uh, really divided just so you can see um, girls without and with an intellectual disability, there is a bit of a difference, not, not, not a significant difference, but some difference. Um, the range of ages um, of girls the first time that they were sexually ex um, exploited in uh, sex trafficking ranged from four years old to 17 years old, and the average age was 14. Um, so you can see that girls with an intellectual disability were slightly older, but um, you know, due to their intellectual, intellectual disability, they were, they were actually functioning at a, you know, a couple of years younger. And also, if you look at these percentages of abuse or maltreatment that they um, experienced, you can see that these are way higher than the national average. And so these were um, girls that had experienced various types of trauma. I um, also wanted to mention, while I'm on this slide, the ethnic and racial distribution. And um, it didn't change. It didn't change if they had a disability or not a disability or if they were um, exploited by their relatives that pretty much stayed the same across all subgroups. And so about 40% of, um, of this sample was African American, about 30% was Hispanic, 15% uh, was Caucasian, and then I had, because I uh, had that uh, uh, sample from Miami, about 9% were Haitian, and then 4, four or 5% were from other races or ethnicities. Okay, so um, yeah, I think I said that the, these percentages are double, triple, maybe more um, than the national average for these types of maltreatment. And I want to point out um, a lot of research has shown this, that child sexual abuse and sexual assault are highly, um, uh, 
create high susceptibility to commercial sexual exploitation. Um, and I, the next thing that the next slide I want to talk about um, talks about there's there was it wasn't just that that was in their past, but there was often a direct link between um, the traumatic um, sexual victimization and uh, CSEC. Well, okay, so um, before I get to that, I just wanted to show you, this is child maltreatment histories of youth who were exploited by relatives. So this is way even higher than that slide before. And so you can see that um, how high the rates were, almost all of them had, uh, all of them had been abused in some way. And 59% of them had experienced all types of maltreatment that I was measuring. So really, this was an extension of really extreme maltreatment that was going on in their home. These, these um, examples from the case files were really triggering or initiating incidents that led, you could pretty much read uh, through the file and see that they were initiating incidents that led to um, either the girl becoming extremely endangered um, and then um, exploited in sex trafficking. So um, I want to point out that many of the girls experienced um, child sexual abuse at young, very young ages. They experienced child sexual abuse in several settings, so at home and at school, or um, at home and, you know, uh, when they ran away. So it was it was, it was not child sexual abuse in one setting, but many settings. Um, the abuse was often ongoing, so it would, you know, it was continuing for years, um, or it involved multiple perpetrators. And all of those factors um, are known to amplify and intensify the impact of child sexual abuse or sexual victimization. Um, I just want to point that out that um, these, and these, um, as we keep going through the slides, often, you know, something like this uh, would be reported and then the next thing was the girl was running away um, in order to get away from the abusive situation. Um, and then also, it was uh, quite common um, for a girl to be raped when she was skipping school or had run away. And that became like the, incident, the initiating incident that led to um, her becoming um, taking a lot of risks and uh, running away again. So, for example, um, in one case, the girl began running away at, at when she was 11 years old. Um, I, it was either the first or second time that she ran away. She encountered three men who raped her, and she was found by the police. But uh, that was kind of the uh, beginning of, um, you know, her life taking a spiral down toward commercial sexual exploitation. Another girl was kidnapped and raped one day when she was skipping school um, by a man that she had met on the internet. So the next slide that I want to, um, is just kind of the percentages, and I will go into a little more detail about running away um, on the next slide. But so, um, uh, just a second, hold on. Um, so. As I mentioned before, many of the girls had were, were experiencing child sexual abuse or sexual, sexual victimization or maltreatment in several settings. So um, it's not really surprising that they would run away from those situations or that they would use drugs or alcohol to try to escape um, the emotional you know, effects of that experience. And then also, it's not surprising if those things were going on in their home that they would be involved with Child Protective Services. So you can see the high percentage of um, girls that were involved with, with um, Child Protective Services uh, in the cases. So these were probably the most commonly reported endangering circumstances. So you can see I, um, from the slide before that almost all of the girls uh, ran away um, you know, about 90%. So, and they tended to run away into dangerous areas. So, um, 
you know, girls would meet a trafficker on their first or second runaway episode. Um, and also you can see this is one connection where a girl was raped and since the rape she began running away frequently and has been exploited in prostitution. So there was often a link between being raped and beginning to run away and then being exploited in prostitution. Um, and also they usually ran away to the worst areas um, in town. Um, also, another endangering circumstance was, um, especially for um, girls with intellectual disabilities, was chatting online. So um, one girl ran away approximately 20 times when she became ch began chatting online when she was in elementary school. Uh, they began sneaking out of the house. And uh, sometimes sexting was involved, so the girl might send a, a picture uh, to someone who, and then it would get passed around and people would begin to contact her. Also, this was commonly noted um, that they would, when they ran away, they would get into cars with strangers. And that would also lead them um, into very dangerous situations. Um, some other endangering situations, some of them were picked up um, and abducted from bus stops. Um, they were recruited at school or foster care. I know that we talk about um, the incidences of girls, you know, being placed in foster care with someone who has been trafficked earlier uh, and then being recruited in that way. But they were also could be recruited at school. Um, there was a situation in Miami, maybe some of you read about it, where there was actually a DCF worker who was um, kind of running a ring, and he was uh, uh, exploiting the girls. Um, that went on for quite a while. So those were some endangering situations. And then also family involvement. Um, one girl was her mother, her, 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 she had been adopted. Her adoptive family was good, and but the biological mother was involved in prostitution and somehow the girl had gotten connected to her and kept running away to her. And then we'll talk about uh, family situations in the next couple of slides. So girls with intellectual disabilities, um, I just want to cover real quickly uh, that this is not a new finding, but girls, uh, girls with intellectual disabilities or youth with intellectual disabilities are at much higher risk to experience um, sexual abuse. And so it shouldn't be surprising that they're also at high risk for um, CSAC or, or sex trafficking. And um, so the, the, there was a review done recently. So basically that's when you combine all the research on one topic. It was actually came out this year in 2015, and it concluded that um, for those with intellectual disability, they have a four to eight times higher risk um, for being sexually abused than those with average intelligence. So it's a it's an extreme risk um, for these types for for this um, population of youth. So the prevalence of um, in the case files in um, Tampa and Miami, 30% uh, of the cases involved girls with an intellectual disability. Um, to be honest, I noticed it in the cases in Miami first, and I thought, well, it just must be a Miami thing. And then when I looked back and looked at looked through the cases in Tampa, I found that it was equal that um, in both. Um, areas, 30% of the cases involved girls with intellectual disability. And I excluded, when I say 30%, I excluded cases that involved girls with intellectual or behavioral disability who were in, um, you know, uh, who had been placed in um, schools for uh, girls with uh, disabilities. So this was 30% were just those with intellectual disability. of you may be thinking, well, how did you define intellectual disability? And this slide kind of tells you how I defined it. So they had, um, I'd say about uh, most, of the, most of the cases that involved girls with intellectual disability actually had some kind of test, um, IQ test that they had done and some scores so that if they, they were below a certain area uh, level, um, below um, 75, equal to or below 75 on um, 
the composite are one of the scores. I put them in the group of intellectual disability. Sometimes the girls did not have a score and it was just written in the file, you know, that the person had a developmental delay or their IQ was actually written in the file. These were the cognitive vulnerabilities that linked specifically to girls with an intellectual disability. So they had a social vulnerability that was unique to them. Um, first off, they uh, were seemed, um, many of them seemed to be unable to say no. So it was very easy for people to tell them what to do. You can't leave. Okay, I can't leave. Um, they didn't really, um, they've been trained or uh, taught to be submissive to whoever's an authority. And so they tended to go along with whatever they were told to do in the situation by the trafficker. Um, the second um, unique vulnerability was their safety. They seemed to be unaware of the danger of running away, getting in cars with strangers, uh, running away to more dangerous environments. And the third um, vulnerability that was unique to them was that they really did not understand, many of them, the difference between a John and a boyfriend. There was a couple case files where the case manager was writing out her notes and she, she said, uh, there was notes in there that you know they had to keep educating um, the girl about what is the difference between a John and a boyfriend. And so there was a lack of understanding that they were being exploited. And often um, it's, they, they saw um, sex as getting attention and didn't understand that they were being exploited. I think there was more interesting um, difference between the girls with uh, intellectual disability and without intellectual disability. And um, so the circles, the red circles there kind of highlight the um, symptoms that girls with intellectual disabilities were reporting. And um, so you can see that their highest uh, trauma symptom that was being reported was aggression. And the reason I wanted to point this out was because aggression due to rape or previous sexual victimization, um, this, is, this is pretty common in research that often um, individuals with intellectual disability, this is how they respond to trauma, is with aggression. And so the aggression would ended up um, resulting in them being removed from homes, removed from their family, being placed in state care, and it, it resulted in an inability for caregivers to continue care. And then that was linked to greater vulnerability to CSEC or sex trafficking. So dealing with that aggression, um, it became obvious that it was a, a, a real need for girls with intellectual disability, for any girl, but especially for them. The next category or uh, type of uh, trafficking that I want to talk to talk about is girls who were trafficked by their family members. And so this was, there was about 30 cases um, of girls who were trafficked by their family members. And the most common uh, relationship was mothers. And there were three categories of mothers. There was uh, mothers who really just wanted to make money. Um, and so they even called themselves a madam and they would arrange dates and bring men into the home and traffic their, their daughters in that way. There were probably the most common was a mother who was an addict. And the most common, the most frequently mentioned type of drug was crack cocaine. Um, and these girls were prostituted at very, very young ages, four or six years old. These were the youngest. Um, this exploitation began at the very youngest age of all the girls. Um, and then there was often, there was also a mother who played the role of trafficker, who was kind of a mentor. So there was often, they were driven by money or drugs, but the mother herself was a prostitute and taught the daughter the rules of the game game and how to be on the street. There was uh, several cases of fathers who were traffickers. And these were, um, I don't know if this, but it's, it's um, common in Caribbean cultures and um, is this idea in other cultures besides that, but that's this idea that if you have sex with a virgin, 
um, you can rid yourself of an STD or HIV. And so that was uh, motivations from two of the cases that involved fathers, and they brought men into the home to have to have sex with the child. Um, there was also um, uncles and male cousins, and their motivation was purely money. Um, in one case, the girl was sold by her mother and who was living in another country, and she was sold to the uncle who was living in the U.S. There was um, ca several cases where um, the cousin basically was setting his cousin, uh, female cousin up on dates, which was really for prostitution. And all of those cases involved the abandonment by the mother. And then there were sometimes uh, more than one relative involved, and those were more um, human trafficking or prostitution rings, and there was actually a brothel that was involved. I mean, the brothel, by brothel I mean an apartment maybe that was being used as a brothel. And um, this happened with the knowledge or involvement of the mother. Of key findings regarding family traffickers was that it, the motivation was often money or owed money, um, a drug addiction, or they uh, exchanged the sex of their child for drugs. And like I mentioned, two of the cases involved this healing. They were trying to get healing, you know, basically selling sex with their kid as a virgin uh, to men who thought they could cure them from STDs. And the mothers played a a key role, either as a primary trafficker, sold the girl to a trafficker, or was involved themselves in prostitution or human trafficking in almost all of the cases that involved uh, family members who are traffickers. So now to the final uh, part of the presentation, just what is this all this need for, uh, what are our implications for prevention? So, um, I think the, the first one uh, is runaway services for all youth, including youth with intellectual disabilities or girls who are borderline, uh, sometimes called borderline intellectual uh, disabilities. So they're not maybe classified in that way, but they have um, below, low, below average um, intellectual disability. I think it's really important to have runaway services because almost 100% of these girls ran away, and that was linked to their um, exploitation. So um, one, one uh, possibility would be to have personally tailored safety plans for, for youth who are at risk of running away. So these are implications for prevention. This is before you know, the, person, the girl has been exploited. So just um, like we do with um, individuals who may be at risk or intimate per, um, intimate partner violence, there's a safety plan. So um, providing an individually tailored safety plan for youth who are at risk of running away, who to call, where to go, where's safe, where's not safe. As I mentioned, many of them ran to the worst places in, um, you could think of, and that's why they were at high risk for being raped or for being exploited. So, um, so not that you want to encourage running away, but if they did run away, what would they do? Who could they call? Where could they go? Um, I think this is really important to give youth some information on that. Also, to provide youth with intellectual disabilities, especially sufficient sexual education so that they can have some personal safety skills and be able to understand what exploitation is um, and that they're being exploited. There's a need for psycho um, psychoeducational material for at-risk youth, including youth with intellectual disability regarding grooming tactics and con games of traffickers. And then um, I think it's really key that um, we give attention to youth who had been victimized. I know that that's everyone's goal, but um, that seemed to be a real turning point in the girls' lives was some traumatic experience and that led them to beginning to run away or to um, be open and susceptible to being exploited in sex trafficking. With family facilitated um, sex trafficking or CSEC, I think it's really important 
um, that those who are working with um, especially risk, uh, high risk youth who are have mothers who have a, an addiction, that they be aware that this could be um, a problem and that they be assessed for this. I think additional safeguards that would prevent sexual exploitation of children living with mothers who are struggling with a drug addiction is really important and um, could prevent this from occurring. And then, you know, I'm a criminologist, so I have to mention some legal and legal, uh, legislative and policy implications. Um, so, um, one is that um, just that mandatory, mand mandatory reporters be, uh, we, I think you're all aware of what that means, but that they be prepared to request immediate assistance from law enforcement and child services professionals who have expertise in human trafficking. So that there, it's not up to every mandatory reporter to decide, is this kid at risk? Is this what's really happening? But they be um, aware of who to call uh, when they need um, expertise on this topic. Also enforce victim, vulnerable victim law. I think this could possibly um, prevent um, buying a sex with girls with vulnerabilities. If we impart, uh, imposed harsher sentences for sex traffickers and buyers of sex who prey on those with a disability, and um, that we, in order to have that be effective, that we include a warning about the possibility of harsher sentences if you're convicted of offending against an individual with a disability. And that should be part of all public campaigns focused on combating uh, CSEC um, and when we're combating demand for illegal uh, commercial sexual exploitation. All right, so that's uh, my presentation. And I, um, hopefully we have some time for questions. Um, I think you can um, type in a question or uh, just let me know if you have any. Let's try to unmute all of you. That would help. Does anyone in the group room uh, have a question for me? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, my name's Tina, and I was wondering how do we get our certificates for this particular? Uh, you know, you need to ask, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just the presenter. <laughs> um, so someone at the crisis center, that would be the, per uh, the person who sent out the email about this. Uh -huh. That would be the, per the person that sent this out or uh, would probably be the best uh, person to request it from. Okay. And it's All right, not sorry. I'm it was, uh, scheduled from two to three. Oh, I thought it was two to four. Oh, okay. uh, sorry. I mean, we, very good presentation. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. Very good. Informative. Thank you. Any other I questions have, there? I have a question for you. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Noel Clark, Rape Crisis. Center manager, Senco Center, Pinellas County. Um, do you uh, are you going to be providing access to the slides, or um, is that a possibility? Actually, I, I actually I know that they're uh, posting this, and if you email me, there's my contact information right there. <laughs> if you email me, I will send you a copy of the slides. But they're I know they're posting this uh, recording for others who weren't able to make it this. Time. So it'll be posted, I think, through the Crisis Center. And also, I, if you email me, I will send you a copy of the slides. Okay. All right. Will do. Thank you. I have one more question for you. It's more content-based, okay. really. Okay. Um, okay. Do you find uh, or do you have a maybe like a go-to answer when someone asks for distinctions between prostitution or voluntary sex work and um, sex trafficking? Well, you know, if if a if a person is under the age of 18, um, I, that is automatically legally um, they're considered a victim of sex trafficking, and so that's the cutoff as far as uh, 
that's kind of an easy one. So if they're under the age of 18, according to the Trafficking Victim Protection Act that was passed in 2000, um, they're considered a victim of, a, um, of sex trafficking. So, and I know there's been some, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, um, I guess I was kind of talking more. I mean, I know that this is geared more towards um, girls, but I guess I was kind of, uh, yeah. For uh, for adults, yeah. there's three things. It's for three. There's three things that that need to be shown if, uh, in order to distinguish uh, sex trafficking from or forced prostitution from unforced prostitution, if you want to call it that. So, um, and there needs to be force, fraud, or coercion. And so the person needs to be tricked into it. So somehow they were, you know, told they were going to work as a waitress, right? And then, well, no, it's not a waitress job, it's waitress plus, you know. So some kind of tricking or fraud um, force, um, so that would be threats or, you know, actual physical abuse. Um, also, um, coer coercion is probably the hardest to prove and to show, but there's been some interesting, if you, if you send me an email, I can send you some uh, good sites to look at, but, but even if someone, um, you know, has a drug addiction, right? And the trafficker is providing their drugs um, in exchange for prostitution. That would be considered coercion, right? So that would not want, that would not be considered voluntary. So those are the three types of uh, those. Are, you have to show that in court. It's really tricky, but um, those are the three categories: force, fraud, or coercion that legally distinguish sex trafficking from prostitution. I hope that's was that helpful. It is. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Well, I just want to uh, thank you all for for coming. And um, again, you can be sure and email me. I'll send you the slides or email me any questions that you have.